I'm from a small town called Kyle, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Anyone ever been to Kyle, South Dakota? It's you, one, that's one more than usual actually in a crowd this size, so <laughs> very impressive. Uh, it's a very small town uh, on the reservation and the original name of Kyle, South Dakota is Prejuta Haka, which means medicine root. And in this region, there are actually a lot of medicine men who come from there historically and in modern times. And I was very fortunate to grow up in a family with a lot of traditional healers and medicine men. And my Lakota name is Prejuta Wichasha, which means medicine man. I always like to joke when people say, what does Prejuta Wichasha mean? I say, it's Lakota for Steve. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I was named after my grandfather, and I'm very fortunate to come from a family with a lot of traditional healers. And as I was growing up, I was able to learn a lot about our traditional ways of medicine, our traditional ceremonies. And I really was on that path of becoming a traditional healer as I was growing up. And uh, when I was in college, I actually went to Arizona State University for undergraduate. I was doing really well in school, so I was being encouraged to become a pre-med. And I was really worried about what my uncles would think about that. You know, does it mean I'm going to the dark side of medicine, you know, going to medical school? Because I've heard all the stories of how our traditional healers maybe haven't been as respected as they could be in modern medical uh, situations. But actually the opposite happened. They weren't discouraging. If anything, they were very encouraging. And one of my uncles, Ray Takes War Bonnet, said, I think this is a good idea, but if you do this, go to their best schools, learn their way of medicine and know it at least as well as they know it because that's the only way you will be taken seriously as a medical doctor. And I was very fortunate. I was able to go to Stanford for medical school and I have my MPH from Harvard and I've worked in a number of different arenas of health. This is a picture of Little Wound School on the Pine Ridge Reservation in Kyle. And on the left is where kindergarten is and on the far right is high school. One of our big challenges that we face is that less than half of the students who start kindergarten actually graduate high school, less than half. So we have a big challenge in terms of leadership, in terms of educated people going into health professions, education, law, et cetera. So it's a big challenge. So we have a lot of rich history, but our biggest issue is that we have now a lot of poverty economically and educationally. We also have challenges with access to healthy food in our impoverished communities. This is a, a picture of the Kyle Cafe. And I think what they've learned here is that you can bread and deep fry just about anything <coughs> and serve it for lunch. And the other reason I like this picture, you can see the res dog chasing the little girl down the street. There. <laughs> well, right across from that is the gas station, which also doubles as the grocery store believe it or not. So if one wanted to have access to healthy food, they go to the gas station. And it's all prepackaged food, lots of sodas, lots of chips, lots of things that can be preserved for a long time on a shelf. Is that healthy food? Is that good for us? Does it lead to things like high rates of type two diabetes? Well, unfortunately it does. There's also a concept in public health called a poverty tax. And when you live in a food desert or a population that doesn't have easy access to healthy choices, they tend to pay more for healthier foods. So trying to buy fresh fruits and vegetables here is much more expensive than it is in Fargo. Isn't that remarkable? So less money and then you have to pay more for healthier food choices. So picture one of my relatives and you can see he has an amputation. And the amputation is from poorly controlled diabetes. There's a program in many of our communities in which if you, if you need a wheelchair and you have an amputation, they'll build a ramp for you. And that's wonderful, so you can have access to your home. But wouldn't it be better if we invested in healthy food in the first place? So we wouldn't have to pay for extra services after the fact when things have uh, gone wrong, unfortunately. But we face all kinds of challenges of trying to manage things like diabetes. Here in North Dakota, this is a, a data from the North Dakota Department of Health. If we look at the prevalence of diabetes, we can see that American Indians have about twice as much diabetes as the white population in North Dakota, about double among adults. So if you have double the prevalence, you would expect to see double the mortality rate, right? Probably twice as many people dying from the disease. 
In truth, the mortality rate is about six times higher for American Indians. So think about that. There's a disparity within the disparity, right? Higher prevalence, even worse in terms of rates of death. Now, this is true in the Dakotas. It's true for American Indians throughout the nation, but it's also true of indigenous po populations everywhere in the world. Two of my colleagues on the left is Alex Brown. He's Aboriginal Australian, and in the middle is Terry Ahau. He is Maori from New Zealand. They're both uh, medical and public health faculty in their respective nations. And they see the exact same pattern of health disparities and poverty in indigenous populations in Australia, New Zealand, and in other parts of the world that we do here in the US. Well, what can we do about this? Does it have to be this way? And are there things that we can look at in terms of our traditional ways and how we used to live that we can recapture and move forward in modern times? So when I start this discussion, I always like to start with a brief history of medicine, very brief. 2000 BC, <laughs> here eat this root. <clears throat> 1000 AD, that root is heathen, here say this prayer. 1800, that prayer is superstition, here drink this potion. 1900, that potion is snake oil, here swallow this pill. 1950, that pill is ineffective, here take this antibiotic. And year 2000, that antibiotic is artificial, here eat this root. <laughs> So we've kind of come full circle, haven't we? <clears throat> Getting back to the roots of medicine. OK, that's a bad pun. I recognize that. Yeah. Well, what's really interesting, when we look at the history of modern medicine, all systems of healing used to have spirituality incorporated, even modern medicine. But we saw a huge change in the 20th century because of advances in science. And probably the biggest scientific advance that we found in modern science is the discovery of antibiotics. So we could suddenly cure infectious disease that used to be deadly. But if we look at antibiotics, that's actually naturopathic medicine. The original antibiotics were actually isolated from mold and, and fungus. And the reason is that for millions of years, bacteria and mold have competed with each other for, for space and food. So they developed chemicals to kill each other. So penicillin comes from penicillium, which is a mold. Streptomycin comes from streptomyces, another mold. So in truth, the biggest scientific advance in modern medicine is that we finally harnessed the healing power of mold. <clears throat> Makes me wonder what mildew might have to offer us. <laughs> now what's interesting, when I talk to my uncles who are traditional healers, they talk about how over the years they would use different types of mold for open wounds, to help clean an open wound and actually use mold. So historically, our tribes have been using antibiotics for thousands of years, potentially. And historically, we lived in a much healthier way. We had hunting and gathering, so it was an all-organic diet at one time, of course. <laughs> Many of our, our tribes also were farmers. Uh, these are pictures on the left from Oklahoma, on the right from New Mexico. And we had traditional farming and very healthy food as a result. And traditional foods are, are whole foods, they're not processed or refined. And we also had a lot of variety of foods. Did you know there's over a hundred varieties of corn? When we think of corn now, we just think of yellow sweet corn, right? That's pretty much all that we have available to us uh, in terms of easy access. But there used to be many varieties of corn, and there are some varieties that actually help to lower blood sugar, believe it or not. So it wasn't all just corn syrup historically. <laughs> so we've seen a dramatic change. Is it possible to get back to this? Well, we do have to recognize we have a big challenge because modern day hunting and gathering is quite different. <clears throat> <laughs> and unfortunately, we have uh, the issue with access to healthy food. There's also what's called the Commodity Food Program. Some of you may have heard of that. It's through the United States Department of Agriculture. And it consists of things like sugar, flour, it used to be lard, now it's vegetable shortening, uh, white bread, uh, some sort of spam-like meat product, I'm not exactly sure what that was, um, powdered milk, grape juice, uh, which I think was just sugar water with purple food coloring. <laughs> and uh, they used to actually distribute pure corn syrup. And on the label it said, use on your pancakes. 
Now, is it any wonder we have such high rates of diabetes and high rates of death due to diabetes? We won't invest in healthy food, but when you have an amputation, we'll build you a ramp. Is that logical? Is that intelligent? Is it ethical? Well, from my perspective, no, it's not. And there's much that we need to do, much that we need to reconsider in terms of how we address health in the United States. So one of my favorite old photographs is actually one of my ancestors from Pine Ridge, and he's a medicine man. And you can see uh, what he's doing here is very different than what we see in the modern clinic, isn't it? He's touching the patient. He's praying with the patient. They're with the earth. And the family and the community are participating in that healing process. And for those of us who participate in traditional ceremonies, the power that you feel when you know your whole community wants you to be better is indescribable. We don't tap into that healing power very well in modern medicine. We have a lot of laws around uh, privacy and, and health information protection. And there's a law called HIPAA that uh, deals with medical information privacy. So when I'm talking to a group of physicians, I always acknowledge this might not be HIPAA compliant, <clears throat> <laughs> but it is meaningful and powerful healing. And do we have the opportunity, opportunity to embrace this? Do multiple cultures have the opportunity to embrace what they once had in terms of a healthier lifestyle? Well, symbolism is very important to us in many traditional uh, American Indian cultures. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this symbol. It's a single serpent wrapped around a staff. This is the staff of Esculapius. That's the ancient Greek symbol for medicine. Single serpent wrapped around a staff. And I'm sure you've seen this one. Two serpents wrapped around the staff with the wings at the top. That's a caduceus. And that is the ancient Greek symbol for traitors and thieves. <laughs> so somewhere along the line, someone really screwed up, didn't they? <laughs> I think they thought it's prettier, it has wings, so we'll call this one medicine. So if you're watching the news and you see this symbol and they say health alert, you know the traitors and thieves must be sick. <laughs> well, this is a medicine wheel. This is our symbol for many things, including medicine and healing. And it's a beautiful symbol, and there's a, a lot of complexity built into the simple circle and cross. And the cross demonstrates things that are opposite to each other, like east and west or north and south. And the circle connecting the ends of the cross shows that all things are connected on this earth. And in a very real and basic way, from the perspective of this room, we could say east is opposite from west, right? We can agree, those are opposite. But in truth, on this earth, if I go east, and I go east, and I keep going east, eventually where am I going to wind up? Yes, right here. So in truth, I'm over there. I'm over there, I'm over there, I'm over there, and I'm right here. It is all truly connected in a circle. The way we look at health and uh, an individual, whether it's the health of the individual or health of the family and community, we look at four main components, spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional. And in order to be healthy, one is in balance in all four directions. Now, another word for a modern doctor is physician, right? So we're saying as physicians, we deal in the physical arena. Phys physical and physician have the same Latin root, physic, which means the natural sciences. So it's very narrow focus in modern medicine, just focusing on the physical aspect of health. I've done a lot of work also in alternative medicine. In addition to being a family doctor, I have training in medical acupuncture, homeopathy, and botanical medicine as well. And in my uh, circles with uh, traditional healers, but primarily with alternative medicine providers. It's really interesting. I've, I've heard them say things like, we've found that when we incorporate spirituality into the healing system, it's much more fulfilling. And from a Lakota perspective, that's kind of like saying, we have found that apple pie tastes better if it has apple filling in it. <clears throat> <laughs> so I tell them, that's very wise. Another one of my uh, favorite photographs is actually Chief Red Cloud when he was meeting with one of the federal government agents and they were doing the land settlements for the reservations. And the reason I like the photograph is there's a lot of symbolism built into this. In the traditional Lakota way, you're supposed to be quiet and humble and you can see he's in a seated position. 
And also a way to show respect is to look down. Actually, if you look someone in the eye, that can be considered a confrontational behavior. So he's looking down. And then look at the federal agent and the symbolism there, standing over him from a superior position, talking down to him and looking him right in the eye. Now, from each person's cultural perspective, they're behaving appropriately. But my question is, at that handshake, how well do they understand each other? How well does Red Cloud understand the agent? How well does the agent understand Red Cloud? Well, if we look at the land settlements, obviously not very well. <laughs> but let's look at this from another perspective. This is a traditional American Indian person being diagnosed with diabetes. And he's working with a well-trained, non-Indian scientific physician. Is it possible that they could have challenges in communication? Well, when I think about diabetes, and when I think about you know, my modern training in medical school and residency, we focus on insulin resistance and high blood sugar. But when a patient is diagnosed with diabetes, do they go to the doctor and say, gee, doc, my blood sugar feels like it's 362? No, they don't. But are there emotional concerns? Is there depression? Is there anger? Is there denial? In the spiritual realm, have I heard patients say things like, why would the creator do this to me? Why would the creator do this to my family? What did I do wrong to deserve this? In the mental realm, is there anxiety? Is there stress? Are they worried about the future? Well, absolutely. And if all we are is physicians, and all we can tell our patients is that your blood sugar is too high, we're not addressing the issue from the patient's perspective, we're just addressing the scientific perspective. And I would put forth that all of us can learn from this. All of us can be more holistic in the way we deal with each other. I would like to close with a picture of Black Elk. He was a Lakota uh, spiritual leader and medicine man from the late 1800s. And we did not have a written language in Lakota. We had uh, an oral uh, history. But he met with a writer in the early 1900s, and they wrote the book Black Elk Speaks. And this is my favorite quote from him. Of course it was not I who cured. It was the power from the outer world. And the visions and ceremonies had only made me like a hole through which the power could come to the two-leggeds. If I thought that I was doing it myself, the hole would close up and no power could come through. And what he's talking about is humility, recognizing that he doesn't own the healing power. The best we can do is try to access it and channel it in the right direction. But as soon as we believe we own it, we no longer have access to it. Now, that's the core value in Lakota. It probably doesn't surprise you that that was not the core value I learned in medical school, is humility. But I think we all could be more humble in our approach. I think that we all could approach each other with more respect, even if we have different backgrounds, we have different histories, and we have different cultures. And let us remember that we all drink from the same stream of consciousness. We are all connected by that same stream of consciousness. We are all related. What we do to each other, we do to ourselves. Act kindly toward my people, for indeed my people are your people. Aho, pilame yayelo, mitakuye oyasi. Thank you all very much.